workmanship that the Lord has given us. I appreciate Nathan and Jenny and part of his church being Amen. here tonight Amen. in Philadelphia, Amen. Mississippi. Amen. We've had a wonderful time with them, a great church in Philadelphia, a great church here in Eubora, and I'm just, um, first my first time here, but I'm so honored to be here. I really am. I'm very honored to be here. Um, and I thank God that the Lord has allowed me to be here with you. And thank you for this opportunity tonight, Lou. Um, we extend to you our love and, you know, our desire as a church in Baton Rouge to partner alongside of you and just be a friend to you, to serve you, uh, to pray for you. Uh, God has a great purpose for this church. I want to talk a little bit about that tonight, of what the Lord has. I'm going to read from two passages of Scripture. Psalm 92, and then Philemon. Uh, Philemon is a one-chapter book in the New Testament, just before Hebrews. And so, if you would, just find those two places in the Bible, Psalm 92 and Philemon. Not Philippians, but Philemon. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to read from there tonight. Kimberly, I just want to say to you tonight, this is in my heart to say to you, I, I don't know you but I'm understanding a little bit of the story tonight. And so I just want to bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm grateful that you're here tonight. I'm grateful that God, by His grace, worked it out to where you could be here tonight. Amen. The blessing that I've seen in the hearts of your friends to be able to have this night with you has moved me, you know, in, in the love of God. And I hope you see the love of God that is in them for you. And I, and I just want to say that it may appear that you're going where men are bringing you, but it's an appointed place if you're a believer, for you're going as a missionary. Amen. You're going to broken people. Amen. You're going to people that need freedom, not from prisons and addictions, but freedom from sin. And God is sending you there as His daughter Amen. in order to be a missionary. You're going with purpose. You're not going like most people go. But you're going as, with purpose as a child of God into a place where people need the Lord. And wherever you go, Jesus is with you. He is not ashamed of you. Yes. And I want you to know that. He is proud Hallelujah. to call you His. He is proud yes. to be with you. Thank you, Lord. And though you may be locked in, there is nothing that can lock Jesus out. Amen. He is with you. And so I just want to give you that blessing tonight and that I really believe this church will always be there for you. Yes. And this will be a family to your life, and that is a blessing. And so, anyway, I'm grateful to meet you. It's an honor to be able to worship with you tonight to worship with you in heaven forever. So it's just so wonderful. Would you pray with me, please? Yes. Can we just ask the Lord's blessings? Yes. Father... I thank you for tonight. I thank you, Lord, for I thank you for Luke and I thank you for Lauren and their family. I thank you for Calvary Chapel here in your poor Mississippi. I thank you, God, for what you're gonna do. I thank you for your purposes, your intentions, and your plans in this community. Father, it is always bigger than we think. It is always greater than what we imagine. Because there's no limitation to you. Yes. Father, though you poor may be small, though it might be in the middle of what people think is nowhere, God, it's where you've chosen. Yes. And Lord, you can do something that will literally shake the earth from you. Yes, here. hallelujah. Nothing impossible for you. Hallelujah. Nothing small with you. Yes. Nothing. Everything hallelujah. is big and exceeding and great and eternal. Oh, God. And Father, I just thank you that that's in thank Luke's you, heart. Jesus. And I thank you, Father, thank that you, it will be done. Thank and you. I thank you, God, that you are bringing mighty men around him. And women around him, Hallelujah, Father, so Jesus. that these purposes would be done. We stand against hell tonight yes. in the name of Jesus. You, Addiction Jesus. in the name Jesus. of Jesus. And Father, we thank you that those that are cooking dope tonight, they're going to be serving Jesus yes. very soon. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Father, that the 2,000 yes. people living here are in, going to be confronted with yes. Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Oh, God, they're going to be saved, Father. I thank you, Lord, for the light and the health of this community oh, that it would God. be talked about all over the world, God. What thank happened you, in your poor Mississippi? God, let it be. Father, this is your ability. Let it's your it testimony. Let it be. And I pray, God, that you will get it 
Hallelujah. in the name of Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to just talk to you for a few minutes. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is the anointing. Um, I'm sure that's a word that you've heard a lot. And I wanted to take a minute and just describe or define for you what anointing is. Because a lot of times that's so misunderstood. And we might think, you know, a person's anointed because of how much knowledge they have. You might think somebody's anointed because of their ability to get really excited and, and we say they're on fire for God. And I'm not saying that those aren't signs of anointing, but that's not really what it is. And I want you to know what the anointing is. In the definition of the Bible, the word anointing means to smear on, to rub on. And it's kind of like we get the word, if, if, if you take oil as an ointment for some type of sickness or some type of problem in your life and you would rub it on you, you're anointing yourself. You're anointing yourself for a purpose and for a reason. The word anointing also means movement. And it also means enablement. All right, And so our anointing as Christians comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit anoints us. And what that means is, He rubs Himself on you. He moves in you. He gives you ability. He enables you. And so it's important for you to know that because that is what the Holy Spirit wants to do with every one of you. And I have a word for you tonight as a church. And, and I really do believe God put this on my heart before I ever came up to Mississippi, the Holy Spirit said, this is what you're going to preach at Calvary Chapel in Eupora, Mississippi. So I believe, I think it's very important that you listen to this tonight because something is required of you, whether you like it or not. Amen. Something is required of you because something's going to happen in this town. Amen. And you're, you're, you need to know it because it's going to affect everything here. And, um, and so I want you to understand what that anointing is. Many years ago, I was playing baseball, and I was running through first base, and somebody threw a really bad throw to the base, and I was already past the bag, and it hit me in the head, and I was knocked out. I woke up in the hospital. I had a concussion, and, and I went on to be okay, but they took care of my head. But what one of the big problems was, was my shoulder. Because when I was running through the base and then the ball hit me, I fell directly onto my shoulder and my neck and my head. And I ripped up my shoulder. And I started having severe pain. And I was not able to have any relief from it. And so I went and I had orthoscopic surgery. And they went in and they corrected the tissue and they corrected the tendons and everything. And then I went into six weeks of therapy. And so the therapy was to give me movement in my shoulder, because if I just would have had the surgery, the pain's gone, but I might never be able to move my arm the way it was made to be moved. So I went to physical therapy. And I'm there in physical therapy, and one of my friends owns it, and he's taking care of me. And we're sitting in the room, and he's measuring me. And he's, he brings out all these devices, and so I'm sitting here with my arm kind of like this. And he says, now we've got to get that arm to move. And we've got to get it to be able to move like it was before it was ever injured. And he said, so what can you do right now? And so I was just like, that. He said, how, far, how can you bring it forward? And I would bring it about like that. And I, he said, now stop when you feel pain. So I started feeling pain, which was limitation. That was pain for me, limitation. I can't go past that limit. And he said, I don't want you to go past that limit. I don't want you to push yourself past any pain. I will do that for you. I am going to work you. And then he said this to me, I'm going to anoint you. I'm, and I said, what did you say? He said, I'm going to anoint you. And I said, explain that to me. And he said, I am going to work you. I am personally going to take the care and the responsibility for the recovery of your shoulder. Wow. And I am going to work you, and I am going to move you, and I am going to do all types of things to you 
so that as my anointing comes on you, I'm going to move you past your limitations. I'm going to move you past your pain. And then eventually you're going to get to the place which I do now. You have full movement of my shoulder because I had a physical therapist who anointed me. Yes, wow. hallelujah. And he, he, yeah. he brought to me an ability that I didn't have without him. And he moved me past pain and he moved me past limitation so that I could function. Now, I want you to see it like this. When I came in here tonight, I brought something with me, and it's mine. And when I leave tonight, I'm taking it with me. But you probably don't notice it that much. It probably hasn't stood out to you that much because it's not anointed right now. But the moment I give attention to it, it is going to become anointed. It's going to be recognized by you, listen to me, not because it did anything, because you still don't know what it is. Not until I begin to fool with it, not until I give it the attention that it needs, are you going to even know what I'm talking about. No. Our brother was singing about heaven. You belong to God. Such were some of you, but you're washed and you're sanctified and you're justified. You're going to heaven. Amen. Amen. When Jesus comes back to get His people, He's getting you. Yes. He's taking you with Him. Amen. But some of you are living a life on the earth where nobody recognizes you. Wow. Nobody knows who you are. Even though you belong to God and you are special, your involvement with the Holy Spirit has been so small that your life has made very little difference. And the Holy Spirit wants to engage you so that by the time He's finished with you, everybody around your life is going to know that you are anointed of the Holy Spirit. It's not what you can do. It's what He can do. Amen. I'm not asking you tonight what you believe you can do for God. That doesn't matter. I don't care what you think you can do for God. The question is, what do you believe God can do with you? Alright? And so, there's something here tonight. It's mine. It can't do anything on its own. The only thing it will be able to do is what I give it the ability to do. And this is like just a little example, but it's true. Because you belong to God, you can't do anything on your own. You can only do what He gives you the ability to do. That's why your pastor encourages you into the altar and encourages you to pray. Because when you do that, you're inviting God to your life. And when God comes to your life, He anoints you. Amen. He takes you past pain and past limitation. Or in other words, He wears you. He puts you on. And then He begins to move through your life so that the things that are happening with you are through you. You really can't take the credit for. That's the anointing. Yes. That is what God is doing. And so what I have here tonight is this. It's just my coat. That's all it is. It's just my coat. It is something for me to wear. It can't do anything without me. But now all of you know what it is and you know that it's mine. And you know that when I leave tonight, I'm taking it with me. But it can't do anything on its own. And the only thing that it can do is what I make it do. And what I give it to do. It has very little power, has very little strength, has very little ability. But the more this coat lets me possess it, then the more this coat is going to be empowered and given ability. And so if I just have the coat there and I swing it around, you know, maybe I can hit bugs or mosquitoes or hit him or something like that and affect his life, but there's not a lot of control over it. And that's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're just out there, I want to do something for God, and you're just kind of wild, and you're hoping something good happens, and you're really not sure of anything, and maybe damage is done and stuff like that. But the Holy Ghost wants to put you on. Yeah. And so you let Him hold you. You're His. And then maybe you let Him put His arm in you. And so now you, your coat can do a little bit more, you know. But it's still not doing everything I want it to do because I don't want to go walking around like this, right? 
But that's the way some of us allow the Holy Spirit to use us. This much, Lord, and no more. But when we begin to just give everything to the Lord, yes. and He puts us on like a coat, now every movement that I make, my coat makes. Right. Everything I reach out for, my coat reaches out for. All of the power that is in me is in my coat. All of my strength is in my coat. Beloved, when the Holy Spirit wears you, when you let Him put you on as a garment, then all of His power is in you. Yes. When He reaches, you reach. When He moves, you move. His ability is your ability and you live a supernatural life. That's anointing. Yes. That's what the anointing is. And a lot of times people stop along the way with anointing and say, hey, I'm content with this. I'm content with this. Maybe some guys would come here and they would say, hey, we've got this little corner building on Dunn Street in Eupora, Mississippi. This is Dunn Street, right? Good enough. Good enough. So, so th <laughs> this is where we are. And, and hey, we're filled up on a Sunday night. I'm good with this. I can go move dirt tomorrow and, and pay bills. But I'm good with this. This is totally fine for me. And a lot of guys would be telling God, the anointing's good enough. This is all that I want. Let's just keep it like this. But not your pastor. No, not your pastor. Your pastor wants a building on Adam Street so he can pull people out of Adam and put them into Christ. He, he said that. That's what he said tonight. That was beautiful. And I'm, I'm just using it, but it's his. And so he's got vision. And he's got desire because he says, Lord, this is great, but it's not enough. There's a bigger vision here. There's more people to reach. There's something in me, God, that's saying more, more, more. Put me on, Holy Ghost. Move me beyond limitations. Let's do greater things. you got to get me there. And that's the craving of his heart. That's what he's desiring. And so that is going to affect you and affect this city whether you like it or not. Amen. You can leave him, but it's still going to affect you. That's right. It's going to affect you in God. It's going to affect you spiritually. It's going to affect you as a Christian. And so I say to you tonight, the best thing and the most important thing you can do is walk in the anointing together. That's right. God, what you do in my church, what you do in my pastor, what you do in his wife, do it in me. Yeah. You've got to seek the anointing that he's seeking or he will take off. You've got to go with Him. You've got to go together because God doesn't want to do anything in Him. He doesn't do in you. That's right. Praise God. He wants to do it in all of you. It takes all of you. Yes. He can't do what God has for Him to do without you. Amen. You are this body that God wants to use. So look at Psalm 92. And I wanted to read this with you tonight. And this is David and this is one of his psalms and he says this in Psalm 92, verse 10. He says, But my horn, which is my strength and my power, you will exalt like the horn of a unicorn. Now listen to this. He says, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And just remember that oil is, a, is, is like an ointment. It, it helps bring past pain, limitation, whatever might be there. David is saying... And David understood this, that God is going to give me a fresh anointing. I believe with all of my heart, God is going to give Luke and Lauren fresh anointing. Amen. I believe it's happening, and I believe it's going to increase. And I don't think it's just going to be local that your ministry reaches. I believe it's going to be beyond here. And I believe God is giving you this anointing. And I believe that God wants to extend this anointing into all of your lives. God is going to give me fresh anointing. You're not a church that is simply here to serve you poor Mississippi. That's right, man. Your call is to serve the living God wherever He calls Hallelujah. you to do it. And you have to believe that we have a Holy Ghost that can get us past limitations. Yes. Hallelujah. You've got to believe that. And so He says, The Lord will anoint me with fresh oil. This word means fresh, means new and prosperous and flourishing. Not a little bit, not in a container. It's like a river of oil. It is so plentiful and He's going to give me this kind of anointing. My eyes 
also shall see my desire on my enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish, and that's that same word again of prospering and a new flourishing. That's you, the righteous. You will flourish like a palm tree, grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Why? To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in Him. God wants to anoint every one of you so that through your life, the Lord can show that God is upright. That God is your rock. That there's no unrighteousness in God. And He wants to anoint you to do it. And where are you going to flourish? And I don't want you to misunderstand this. Because it can happen anywhere. You can flourish in your business. You can flourish in your career. You can flourish among your friends. There can be a greater anointing upon you to affect people, to affect this city. Maybe to have an internet ministry. Maybe to have a podcast that reaches 100,000 people or more. Maybe God will cause you to flourish in all of these types of things. But where you're really going to flourish is in the house of God. That's right. You're going to flourish. You're going to be anointed to commune with God. Yeah. You are going to be anointed to pray like you've never prayed before. It won't be an agony. It won't be boring. Yes. It won't be a drudgery. God is going to anoint you with life. It's going to be fresh. It's going to be movement. It's going to be beautiful. In the house of God, you're going to be powerful. And you're going to be mighty. Why? Because God is going to send people to His house that need to be free from addiction. That's right. Amen. That need to be loved that need to have curses broken over their life. And in order for that to happen, God needs an anointed people Amen. who have that power to do that. Amen. And so that's what God is going to do with your life. Now, this is, an, uh, this is a psalm of David, and David says, the Lord is going to give me a fresh anointing. If anybody knew about fresh anointing, David did. David had many anointings in his life. And what I mean by that is he had many increasing anointings in his life because he held many positions in life. Right. Listen to me. When David was young, he was given the job of taking care of his sheep, his father's sheep. So he needed a shepherd's anointing. And God gave him a shepherd's anointing. Amen. But as David would increase in that and his anointing would increase, he would need a giant killing anointing. Amen. That's right. Because he would be called upon now not only to tend sheep and take care of the trouble that they will face, there's coming a day in David's life when he's going to be called upon to take down Goliath and his brothers and the Philistines, and he's going to have to have a greater anointing to do this. Amen. And then there will come a point that David will need not only a giant killing anointing or an anointing to be a military genius and a skilled warrior, but David is going to need a king's anointing because I'm going to make David king. So David lived in this understanding that my anointing is always increasing. God's work in my life is always evolving. Everything that has happened in your life good or bad, is for what God is about to do in your life, which is good. A lot of times we stop at the bad and we cave in right there when one more step would have brought, oh my God, if you wanted me to be here, why did I take so long to jump into it? All right. And, and so that's what God wants for us, all right? And so David understands this. Now listen to me carefully. When David was a shepherd, and God anointed David to be a shepherd. He had to have an anointing. Because there were things that would plague sheep. Wolves. Bears. Lions. Would come into those hillsides. And they would attack those sheep. And David even confessed. That there were times I had to go after a bear. To rescue one of my lambs. I had to go after a lion. <coughs> and rescue one of my lambs. And so David realized when he's standing before Saul with that giant of a warrior in the valley named Goliath, 
And Saul is saying to David, you're just a kid. This is a trained warrior. What is your resume, David? And David simply realized, God anointed me to be a shepherd. And under the anointing of God, David would say to Saul, when a bear came and took one of my lambs, I went after that bear and I slew it. And when a lion came and took one of my lambs, I went after the lion. I grabbed it by its beard, by its hair, its mane, and I slew it. And David said, God taught these hands to walk. God gave me the ability to bend a bow of steel. So I know God will take that giant down. I know God can. His confidence is not in himself. His confidence is in the anointing. I'm at a new place. God will anoint me with fresh oil. I will flourish in the house of God. And I'm going out against that giant in the name of our God. And God is going to bring him down. And he knew that. Hallelujah. But understand this. When David was anointed as a shepherd, all he had to do was deal with bears and lions. That's not so bad compared to Philistines and giants. Bears and lions might be a significant problem, and they certainly are. I wouldn't want to face one, you know. But David did, and they don't strategize. Giant bears and lions don't have armies. They just kind of prowl around mainly by themselves, and if they see a lamb, they go get it. They're not plotting something out. But now, in his increased anointing, he has to deal with the Philistines. Right. He has to deal with men who strategize and plan and make war upon David's life. So now this is more difficult. My purpose has become greater. And because my purpose has become greater, my life now is more endangered. There is an enemy out there that is not unskilled like animals, but now my enemy has become more skilled and focused upon me. And I have to walk in this anointing. And that was with the Philistines and the giants. And then David's anointing would increase and he would become the king of Israel, right? And Samuel anointed David to be the king and now he had his greatest problems. Because now his greatest problems was his family. And you haven't faced anything until you face the aggression of your family in trying to serve Jesus Christ. Because you don't know where you're safe. Right. You don't know if you're loved. You don't know if you're hated. You don't know what's being plotted against you because you don't know who a friend is or who an enemy is. At least with the Philistines, I knew they were enemies. But now it's my family. It's, it's, it's churches. It's people. It's Christians. Oh my God. There's no safety ever. I've got to walk in this anointing. And let me tell you this. The anointing on David was not just for David. That anointing that came upon David caused him to go into the Philistines and raid them and destroy them and fight them. And it enraged Philistines to where they would begin to make war on Israel because of what David was doing to them. And David was pushing them back. And David's anointing literally demanded that the people in my life have also got to be anointed. Those 400 men that would become David's mighty men, they have to have David's anointing to walk with David. Amen. Amen. And beloved, I say this to you tonight, where God has taken this man, what God is going to do with this, this, this ministry, this church, this people, if you're going to walk with them, you've got to walk in that anointing. Amen. It has to matter to you. You have to pray for it. You have to believe God for it. God has to move you past your limitations and past your pain or there will come a point when it's just like, I can't keep up with you, Luke. I don't, I, I, I'm scared of that. I can't make that move. This is too much for me. I don't know if I can handle it. I don't care who you are right now. You're not going to do it because you're strong, intelligent, and mighty. It is only the Holy Spirit Amen. that can do it. Hallelujah. And He wants to anoint you. Hallelujah. He wants to anoint you as He anoints this ministry and as He anoints this church to do things that only God can do. So, God, you have to walk in this anointing together. Amen. What God is speaking to your pastor has to simply confirm what He's already speaking to you. Amen. 
When the pastor comes and shares vision and the pastor comes and shares things that he's heard from God, your, your response is, about time, he showed me that a month ago. You know, it's kind of like that anointing is there. Like, I got it. I'm with you. Let's go. Let's do it. You know, let's step into this. Now, let me say this to you. When you're anointed of God and you have power with God, you don't feel it. You just don't feel it in you. If you're, if you're sitting in, in a restful position and, you, and you're just resting, I don't feel power. You're, you're, you don't feel power as you're sitting there. You're just kind of sitting back like this, like me. You don't, you're just natural. You're just relaxed, right? You don't feel this you know, incredible strength surging through your body. You're just resting. When are you going to feel power? When are you going to feel actual muscle work happening in you? And power surging through your body. It is when something is there that is resisting you. That's right. And when it is resisting you, and you begin to push back on it, if you're bench pressing, and you begin to push that weight, you're going to feel your power working. But if you're just sitting on the bench, and you haven't even laid back yet to lift the weight, you don't feel anything. And it's the same thing spiritually. As Christians, you can sit there and say, I don't feel this strength. I don't feel this power. I don't think I'm capable. I don't think I'm able to do that. And you don't realize how much power you actually have because of who is living in you. But I'll tell you something, beloved. Go push on the gate of hell and watch how much power yes. you've got. Hallelujah. And some of you are doing that. You're going into the prisons. You're going into the woman's prison. You're going into the men's prison. You're pushing on hell yes. and some souls are coming out. Yes. Yeah. You know, oh my God, there's Hallelujah. power here. Praise yes. the Lord, you know. And that's the anointing. That's the anointing. And so you've got to exercise yourself. And I just want to say this in two ways. And please listen to this. In two ways about this. If your life is to be different, you have to faith differently. And I'm not saying live differently. You have to faith differently. I'm not telling you just do something different for the sake of doing something different. But I'm saying, listen, enlarge your faith. Do something by faith that's different. If you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again that you always do, you're not going to understand the potential of what the Holy Spirit is able to do in your life. The movement He's able to give you. The limitations that He's already brought you past that you didn't even know that you were past yet. So you've got to do some different things. I'll explain it to you like this. Not everybody who did great things with God had this open heaven and this direct word from God. Go do this. Move to that city and do this. I'm going to bring Joe into your life and Sarah into your life and Bill into your life. You're going to, and this is... A, most people who do great things for God never hear that. They don't have this open heaven. They have this belief that God is moving. They have this burden and this desire inside of them to walk with God. They believe it's God and they step out in faith. Believing that it's God. So here's David. Saul wants to kill him. That's his king. The king of Israel. He wants to kill him. And David flees to the cave of Adullam. And in this cave, David's family comes to him because they're all in danger because of David's anointing. And now... People find out David's in the cave of Adullam, so men that are distressed and in debt, wanted by the law, they all go to the cave of Adullam. 400 depressed men who could break your neck in a second. And so what does David do? I'm not going to sit here in a cave of depression. I'm going to be their captain. There's an anointing on my life, and they're going to know that they're anointed with me. Amen. And we're going to go out and do exploits for our God. God. But he doesn't know what's going to happen. And so David takes his parents and he goes to the land of Moab and he goes to the king of Moab and he says to the king, now this is 
interesting. David says to the king, would you care for my parents and watch over them because I don't know how it's going to go for me. That's right. I don't know what God is going to do with me. I don't know how it's going to turn out. My parents will be in danger in Israel. So would you watch over them in Moab until I see what God does? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So it's not like always you always know exactly what it is God wants you to do. The Apostle Paul said that my hands are innocent of the blood of all men in this part of the world. My job is through here. I've always wanted to go to Asia. I guess that's where I'll go. That was what was in my heart. So Paul begins to move to Asia. And while Paul's going to Asia, because that was what was in his heart, and he knows he wants to serve God, he's going to serve God in Asia, goes to sleep one night, a man from Macedonia in a vision says, Paul, come to Macedonia. Okay, that's where God wants me to go. And so he goes to Macedonia. He didn't know. The Apostle Paul didn't walk around with all of these heavenly visions and this open heaven and this direct turn here, Paul. Go down that street, Paul. Go to Adam Street, Paul. What? No, he's just saying, this is what's in my heart to do and I'm walking by faith. Right. I know I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. I know I'm called to preach the gospel. I've done everything I can do in this part of the world. I'm going to go over there, but God says, I'll go over there. God says, I'll go over there if that's where God says. He's walking in that and He's doing the things of God. Beloved, I encourage you to do that. Yes. I encourage you. I encourage you to go past the limitations of where you've been comfortable ministering and take a different step of faith and to possibly some new things that God wants you to do and what He's going to show you He is very capable of doing in your life. This is the anointing I'm talking about. Most of my life, I have lived doing things I am not qualified to do. I am not qualified to be a pastor. I've never been to school. I'm not qualified to be a preacher because I can't speak. I'm not qualified to talk to people or stand in front of people because I'm probably the shyest person in this room. What I'm doing, I am doing under the anointing. That's what I'm doing. And people that know me know that. I can't talk. I can't put two words together. You get me out of this setting and sit at a table with me, and I'll say, how was your day? Great. Beautiful day, wasn't it? Yeah. And I'm done. I don't know what else to say. You know? That's it for me. I I wish I could be Jeff Lee and sit with a guy on an airplane for 12 hours and talk his head off. But I'm not that guy. I'm just shy Lee Ship. But what I'm doing, I'm doing under the anointing of God. God. God started a church in Baton Rouge with my wife and I. Why? God only knows. I don't know. I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a minister. I wanted to make money. I wanted to be a businessman, support missions and all of that. But, I mean, just this is the life that I want. I was going for it all my life. But God tells me to do this. Without doubt, this is what I have to do. Brother Clinton, in the last five years of his life, he says, Lee, I need you to travel with me and preach with me. I've been all over the world preaching with some of the greatest men in the world. I'm riding on a plane next to Clinton, and if, if you know who he is, if you don't, you need to. And I'm riding on a plane next to Clinton, and I'm thinking to myself, God, what in the world am I doing here? I do not belong here. This man does not need me next to him, helping him, preaching with him. He doesn't need this. Why me, God? But God was showing me that I am anointing you and bringing you past limitations and pains to do things that I want you to do. And I've had pains in my life. I've had reasons to quit. I've had reasons to run away. I've had reasons to say, forget it. Being a pastor, no way. No more. But the anointing brought me past the pain. And now I see the joy of it. My wife and I just watching church today on Facebook back home in Baton Rouge and we just turned it on. My daughter's up there on the platform singing and twirling and dancing and talking to the people and preaching to the people. And we have four other people that end up speaking words of prophecy and talking to the people. We've got hundreds of people in the altars and praying for one. And I'm just like, oh God, thank you. We didn't run away. Hallelujah. Yes. 
Thank you, we didn't run away, God. You, you, you anointed me past the pain. Look at the grace. Look what you're doing. You know, we just text a message back to our associate pastors. I'm not coming back. You have better services with, without me. <laughs> this is awesome. You know, it's just so awesome. And they text back good. <laughs> you know, it's just like, praise God. You know, they're in prayer meeting tonight. Just having a one. We got kids from around the city that come to our prayer meetings. I'm talking about kids. I'm talking about teenagers. Amen. Yeah. Their parents go to other churches on Sunday mornings, but they drive to our church on Sunday nights to be in our prayer meeting. Because there's life in there. God has anointed us and He's doing things. And people are getting saved. And there's such healing and miracles taking place. Thank God we didn't run. God anointed me past the pain. When I wanted to quit, I said, oh God, I can't go past this. This is all I got. And He says, oh, I know. I know, but I'm about to anoint you like that friend of yours did with your shoulder, and you're going to have more movement than you ever thought you had. The next thing I'll say is this. First thing I'll say is just faith differently. Just do something differently. Get involved in the high school. Just take a step of faith. Get involved in the high school. Start a feeding ministry. Start a clothing ministry. Set Set up a little prayer station on the corner on Saturday, see who stops by and says, hey, will you pray with me? Just do something by faith different than what you've been doing. And just watch what God begins to do. It'll be fun. Amen. It's really fun to serve Jesus. Yes, it is. Yeah. The next thing about David's life that I want to say, and I want to say to you, is it's about the pain. It's about getting past the pain and living in a relationship with a really wonderful and exciting God. Because God is really wonderful and good and exciting. And I love Him. I love Him. And he's, He and I have walked through some very difficult times in life. The death of a child. My mother, who was a Judas in my life and tried to destroy my marriage my church, our ministry, my mother. I've been through things. I understand these battles. I understand these heartaches and these pains that we have. And so I was looking at David's life and this really ministered to me. David is infatuated and lustful with a woman named Bathsheba. And he makes an arrangement to have a relationship with her. Her husband, who is one of David's soldiers, is in war. So he brings Bathsheba to the palace, and he has a relationship with her. She responds to David a little bit later. She says, David, I'm pregnant. And now David's in trouble because he said, how do I hide this? And so he tries to get her husband back from war to be with her, but her husband won't do it. So David says, listen. He writes a letter to Joab, his general, and and David says... When Uriah gets back out there, this is what I want you to do. Put him where the battle is the hottest. And when he's out there, pull back. Pull the army back so that he will die. And it wasn't just him. There was dozens, if not hundreds, of other men that were murdered by David that day in order to kill one man. An adulterer, a murderer, a liar, covering things up. All of these things that go into David's life. A man after God's own heart. And he was. God even said that after David was dead. He said that to Solomon, David's son. Your father was a man after my heart. Isn't that beautiful? That kind of grace. We can be the most awful people. But by grace, we can be people after God's heart. So the story goes that Uriah is dead. David brings Bathsheba in to his palace. Makes her his wife. And... She gives birth to the baby. And the baby is very sick. They don't think the baby's going to live. So David goes into a chamber to pray. He doesn't eat. He doesn't bathe. He doesn't do anything. He's just in that chamber praying. His men are worried about him. David, are you okay? You need to eat something. No, I'm not eating. David, what's going on? He said, maybe the Lord will be merciful. Maybe the Lord will spare my child. And so I'm, I'm praying, seeking the Lord. Then 
the news comes that the baby dies, and now somebody's got to go tell David. They're terrified. How's he going to take this? He could hardly do anything when the baby was alive. Now he's dead. David's just going to collapse. So they go say, David, your child died. And surprisingly, David gets up. He bathes himself, and he goes and eats. And they said, David, we don't understand. What is this response? And he says, well, who knows if the Lord would have been merciful while he was alive to spare his life. But the Lord took him. And I will go to be with him, but he can't come be with me now. And that was enough. David was content. That was the Lord's decision, and that was good for David. And then the Bible says that David went to Bathsheba and knew her. That's a sexual word. And God gave her another baby. And this baby's name would be Solomon. And this blows me away. Of all of David's wives and of all of David's children, it would be this relationship with Bathsheba that Solomon would be born who would be the God-chosen king God. after David. Amen. I don't understand that. Mm-hmm. But God did it. But this is what's amazing to me. David didn't go into Bathsheba and sit there and say, listen, baby, God took our child... He's not pleased with our relationship. He's not pleased with our marriage. I can't handle this again. I can't live through another child suffering because of us. I love you, but listen, we're, 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 we are not ever going to try to have another baby because I just can't bear what God's going to do to us. He didn't do that. Why didn't he do that? Because he's anointed. And the Holy Spirit is moving him past the pain. In other words, it was like this. David refused to live under the fear or the suspicion that God was bad. And he went to his wife Bathsheba and he said, I live under the knowledge and the understanding that God is good and God loves us. And Bathsheba, we're going to have another baby because God is good. And beloved, I say that to you tonight. Some of you have got to sit down with God and sit down with life and say, what has happened has happened, but I'm not going to live the rest of my life thinking that God is bad and He's always out to get me and something terrible is going to happen tomorrow. I would rather live under the knowledge that God is good and good things are coming. Amen. That's right. And I'm going to live for that and the power of God is going to bring me there. Hallelujah. Because I say yes to God and to His power. Yes. So you have that choice. Thank you, Jesus. It is the anointing who will move you past it, but you have that choice of what you want to do. And you can live past that pain like David did. And you can give birth to things that in fear you would have never given birth to. So the last scripture I want you to read is in Philemon. And I hope I'm not taking too long. But I'm almost through. You just come, you get one chance to speak and you just want to say everything. Philemon 1, I just want to read verse 6. If you would read it with me. That the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. (coughs) Beloved, I say to you tonight, the anointing has to be activated. It is activated by faith. Read this verse again. That the communication of your faith. That word communication means the lifestyle of your faith or the demonstration of your faith may become effectual, powerful, seen, demonstrated. How many of you tonight have something in you that just cries out to God, I want you to anoint me. I want... I want my life to somehow demonstrate your power. I want you to do things through my life. Yes. Well, this is your answer. You have to acknowledge 
you have to confess, you have to speak every good thing that is in you in Christ. Aren't you glad that part's there? Yeah. Not every good thing that's in you, because you would probably say, well, there's nothing good in me, and there isn't. But it's not saying what's good in you, it's saying what's good in you in Christ. Amen. Yeah. You acknowledge that, you confess that, and then you communicate that. That means you give that. If you see a sick person and you want to see the power of God and you want to see increased anointing in your life and you see a sick person, you don't say, oh, oh my gosh, where's Luke? I need to get Luke to come pray for No, no, no. Christ is in you. Amen. Hallelujah. You acknowledge, does the healer live in me? Yes. Come to terms with that. Does he live in me? Is that good thing in Christ in me. Is He there? Is the healer that? Yes. Then I'm going to give, communicate that faith in that name of Jesus Christ and pray for that sick person. Amen. Let God do what He wants. Yes. But Amen. that's what I'm going to do because I know that Jesus Christ lives in me and He's able to do it. I'm going to go up to the smartest professor that can... can have an intellect that runs circles around my brain, and I'm going to go up to the, the smartest professor acknowledging that somebody smarter lives in me. Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to talk to you about atheism. I want to talk to you about the living God. I want to talk to you about creation. Who are you? I'm nobody. But I acknowledge there's somebody good in me who's smarter than you. Yeah. I'm yeah. not this inferior person yeah. anymore. I'm yeah. not this nobody. Right. I'm not this little person that has no anointing. God, put me on like I put on this coat. you got somebody to reckon with inside of me. Bring it on. Yes. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Bring it on. This is the adventure of Christianity. Yes. It's so easy to live in a chair and you'll bore yourself all the way to heaven. But get out of that chair. That's start right. living by faith. Yes. Look for places Hallelujah. where God can be demonstrated. Oh, your life will change. It will change. So I say this. For too long, the devil's had his hand on too many of you anointing you. Amen. That's right. You have been agreeing with the devil that you're a nobody. Right. That you're not important. That all you've ever known is pain. And that's all you're ever going to know. And that you can say God is good all you want, but you know come Monday, Lucifer's going to be at your door. Amen. And he's going to put it out. He's going to show you. Say God's good all you want. I'm going to give you badness today. And you know most Christians expect that. That's right. Even though the Bible says the mercies of God are fresh and new every morning, yes. we wake up and say, oh, I wonder what the devil's going to do to me today. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 not me. I don't do that. I said, devil, you better watch out with what I do to you today. Yeah. You know? Amen. Because somebody's in me yes. who is good. That's right. That's right. And His mercies are That's fresh good. and new every morning. And Amen. His compassions are yes. extended to me. And I don't know how I am going to have to engage you today. I'm sure I will have to meet you and fight you. And you're going to try to do something. But my God yeah. is going to answer. Amen. And I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord. Yes. And I believe it. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land yes. of the living. Devil, you will not anoint me. You will not touch me. You will not cause me to move. I will move by the Spirit of the Lord. Yes. I will listen to the testimony of Jesus over my life. And I will walk in that anointing. Hallelujah. That is for every one of you. And I'm a, I tell you, I really believe this. That God has intentions for you. And they're, they're beyond things that you thought. But I don't think they're beyond things you've dreamed. And God is going to do things. And I tell you, church, you've got to grow in that anointing with Him. You've got to walk together and grow together. Because your battles are going to become more significant. And you're fighting not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Fight together. Love together. Walk in unity. And yes. watch God. Amen. Watch God. This is a fun life. Yes. It's a great life. It really is. 
Enjoy it. Love it. Walk with God. I want you to stand with me. And just thinking about this tonight, I just ask you tonight as we're praying, would you just say yes to the Lord? Yes. Would you just say yes to His anointing? Yes. Yes. Would you ask the Lord to give you faith to acknowledge the good things that are in you in Christ? There's grace in you. There's mercy in you. There's power in you. There's healing in you. There's wisdom in you. There's goodness in you. There's mercy in you. Because Jesus is in you. Everything Jesus is, is in you. And there is nothing impossible for you. There is nothing too hard. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Would you just say that? Yes. The Bible says in Philemon 1, 6, was it said, you've got to acknowledge it. You have to speak it. You have to confess it. You have to believe it. I can preach this until tomorrow and not affect one of you. But the one person in here who can say, oh, that is me. I acknowledge it. I confess it. I believe it. I'm moving on. I'm getting past the pain. I'm getting past the limitation. God is anointing me with a yes. fresh, flourishing anointing. Hallelujah. Pray it right now. Hallelujah. Just come on, pray it. Oh. Father, I say yes to you. Yes, in the name I say of yes to you, Lord. I receive Jesus your anointing in my life. I receive your anointing. I receive, God, what you want to do with my life. what you want to do with my life. And you want to do greater things. You want to do greater things. Things, things that I can't think. Things that I haven't thought about or imagined. Or or even ask. Or even ask. And I say, God, get me there. I say, God, get me there. Get me past the pain. Get me past the pain. Past the limitations. Past the limitations. Let me really believe. Oh, let me really believe. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. God. Just right now, some of you just rebuke the devil from your life. He's been talking to you for too long. He wants you to be God in his bed. He wants you to be all you ever got. No, you're under my feet. God has greater things. God has more. Lord, I pass on it in the Sunday of my son. We have victory over you, devil. In the name of Jesus. Lord, you're a liar. You are defeated. You get your hands off my life, my family, off of this church. You are defeated. You're under our feet tonight. We've got the victory over you, devil. We're not victims. We're more than conquerors tonight through the one that loved us. Oh, he spoiled you. He overthrew you on Calvary. Jesus is high and lifted up. His enemies are his footstool. We are raised, seated with Christ in heavenly places tonight. Oh, Jesus, we thank you tonight, Lord. God, we thank you that we're not victims. We are victorious. God, I know you want to do more. I know you have more. You have better. My God, hallelujah. Lord, let us see more. Let us see better. Let us see the best days for the church of the living God are right up ahead. Not behind us. Oh my God. We're not 50 years too late. We're right on time. Right on time to see a move of God. To see revival. Oh God, let it come to our town. Oh, let it come, Lord. To you pour a Mississippi. And let it come through us, Lord. Let us be the vehicle. Let us be the vessel. Let us be the people of God that rise up out of depression, out of fear, out of doubt, out of the lies of the enemy and walk in a fresh anointing. My God, let us be that. Thank you, Father. Thank you for fresh anointing tonight, God. Thank you for the liberty of the Holy Ghost. My God, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Oh, Lord, have your way in us tonight, God. Build faith in us tonight, God. Oh, get out of the house of mourning. Go to the house of dancing. I don't know all of you in here. Hallelujah, Jesus. But I do know Nathan. And there's something going on in your life because it was spoken about last night. Yes. Ministry. you got to let God move you. Come up here. Amen. Is there anybody else? You feel like God is calling you to something. It's scary. It's scary. It's beyond your ability, but you feel something. Praise God, brother. Anybody yes. else? Come on, Sean. Yes. Praise God. Come up here. Just a little bit. Come up here, Jesus. 
the mighty men, the mighty women. Praise the Lord. How many of you would say tonight, I got to get out of this place of men? I got to get out of this place of men. I got to get out of this pain. I got to get out of this heartache. I got to get out of this. It's just so mundane and so, so boring to me. I got to get out of it. God, you got to move me to freshness. David said, God will give me a fresh anointing. How many of you need something fresh? Yes. I would imagine we all do, right? Yes. So just where you are, would you begin to pray? Yes. And let me ask you something. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, church. I need you as a church to come pray over these brothers and these sisters tonight. I want you to come lay hands on them. And I want you to pray. Because they're being called by God for something more in their life. They need your support. Yes. Come around in front. Come around in front and pray for them.